Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, this is um, Scott Bottomer here from uh, from Posture, and welcome to the the Friday afternoon podcast. Um, some of you guys may know me as the uh, the key account manager from up here in Scotland, but I also head up the Agile Working Project um, nationally. So some of you may have already been to the Agile Working events in some of the some of the major cities around the UK, um, and certainly one of the biggest uh, and most uh, sought after topics has been the, the legal content and uh, yeah, the legal considerations around how we approach agile working and, um, and managing an agile workforce. <clears throat> so uh, really lucky today to have Simon Bellum, who's a partner at DMH Stollard, um, to come here and talk to us this afternoon. Um, he's known for his ability to deliver pragmatic commercial advice to both public and private sector organizations, according to the blurb. And uh, yeah, he's uh, we've just been having a chat um, about about what he's looking to cover today and, and really excited to hear what he's got to say um so without further ado i will uh i'll pass them over to you guys um feel free to pop some questions here in the tech in the um in the box and we'll get them to him later on in the session thanks very much okay thanks scott uh, well good afternoon everybody my name is simon bellum and as Scott was saying, I'm a partner at DMH Stallard. We're based down in Crawley. It's a lovely sunny afternoon here. I hope it's nice where you are. Now, when people ask me well, what's happened over the years in terms of employment law, I reckon one of the biggest changes has been the move away from traditional office-based, factory-based, nine-to-five working towards much more agile working, uh, move towards off-site working, sometimes at home, sometimes with uh, flexible hours. And we all know the benefits in terms of utilization of property, the efficiency, and the benefits when it comes to recruiting new staff. Um, now, it's not just off-site working that we're, we're talking about. Many of the issues which I'll be discussing apply to other forms of agile working, such as shared space working and hot desking as well, and particularly in relation to health and safety. So what I'll be looking at is uh, some of the legal implications. Um, I'll try and avoid too much technical employment law. Uh, and then secondly, I'll be looking and taking a particular look at the health and safety issues that uh, arise in terms of agile working. Now, one of the things that I'll say at the start is that there's an awful lot of useful and helpful information available on the internet. And particularly, uh, the ACAS guidelines and checklists are very useful in terms of looking at some of the legal issues that you have to think about uh, when you're putting in place agile working. And obviously, when it comes to health and safety, the Health and Safety Executive website has got an awful lot of material um, which, which can help you help make sure that you cover all of the different angles. So. We'll start off looking at some of the legal issues that flow from agile working. Um, usually agile working will involve a, a change in the working arrangements. So staff working at uh, the office or in the factory allowed to work from home or perhaps allowed to work different hours. It will involve some sort of change in the employment relationship. And I would always in, in, encourage any employer to record that change in writing simply for the sake of clarity, really. Everybody knows where, where they stand. Sometimes, if there are a lot of changes, uh, you might be thinking about preparing a new contract of employment. But if there are not a lot of changes to the arrangements, then it can probably be done just by a side letter, a uh, normal letter, uh, just recording the, the changes in the arrangements. And I'll, I'll talk about some of the areas that might need to be uh, recorded. I think when you're, you're setting up um, agile working, particularly home working, always think about the possibility that it's not going to work out perfectly and you might uh, want to change back to more traditional forms of working, working back in the office or in the factory. So include some provision that uh, there'll be a, a review as to how it's going and the employer reserves the right to, to change things back to the uh, previous arrangements. I think uh, trial periods can be very useful. You know, there are a lot of issues in relation to agile working, particularly home working or changing at the hours that people work, allowing them to work more flexibly. 
Sometimes you won't know whether it's going to work out well. Um, so there's no harm at all in saying, right, well, we're going to run this for, as a trial for three months. If it works well, it continues. If it doesn't work well, then we'll reverse it. And the trial, trial period can be anything. Could be a month, could be three months, could be six months. One of the important things that you might be looking at is, does the flexible working and the change involve any change to the duties of the employee? or any of the commitments that they owe or the, or, or the way that they work. Um, if you're looking at job descriptions and you've got somebody who is uh, working from home, you, you've got much less control over uh, what they do with their time. And you might want to increase the focus on outputs uh, in terms of job description. So you, you're talking specifically about what the expectations are in terms of what the uh, employee will achieve with their time. Um, there may be changes to how the employee is managed. Um, you might be asking the employee to come into the office or the factory for particular meetings, review meetings, um, and those ought to be recorded somewhere. So if there is a change in, in the actual job and what the individuals are required to do, reporting lines, etc. make sure that that's recorded. Status, well, you, you may well see from a lot of the, uh, the ordinary press that there's lots of cases involving people like Uber drivers, delivery workers, uh, and they all revolve around the important issue of is somebody who works for you an employee? Are they self-employed? Or are they in between? Are they a, a worker? Because workers have significant legal rights. And it's possible that asking somebody or allowing somebody to work more agilely, more flexibly, sometimes from home, sometimes having more control over what they do, sometimes bearing more of the expenses of the working environment. They might be funding their own office equipment, etc. That could tip the balance in terms of the issue of status. So it's something to, to keep in mind. The place of work and mobility of the employee is an important, potentially a, a contractual change. So if you've got somebody who has previously worked in the office or in the factory, they're now going to be working from home, does their place of work change? And it could be important, maybe because if in the future there are redundancies, so you've got to look at the issues of what is the employee's workplace, or perhaps there's restrictive covenants in somebody's contract which says that they won't work for a competitor within five miles of their place of work. Sometimes it's very important to know what the place of work is. So you'll need to record, if somebody is working from home in particular, whether their place of work changes. Um, my suggestion there is it's probably better to say, well, look, your place of work remains the office or the factory. Um, but you'll be allowed to work from home, and that will keep the place of work unchanged. Another important area is the hours of work and working time. You know, quite often, agile working involves working flexible hours, allowing people to work in the evening, in the middle of the night, perhaps. Um, make sure that uh, you record any agreement to any changes in working times. You might think it's helpful to say, well, we need at least some core hours when they're going to be available to colleagues. So write down what the commitment is, when they will be available if they're working from home. Don't forget rest breaks. Um, the working time rules and the rules on uh, rest breaks apply just as much to somebody working at home as they do somebody working in the office or in a factory. And then pay and bonuses. Again, taking up that theme that sometimes somebody working from home, you no longer have control over how they're spending their time, what they're doing with their time. You might um, think about shifting some of the rewards that they receive to, work, to make them more output-based again, so that you know, effectively they're, they're rewarded for their productivity. There's a, a nice picture on the screen, hopefully, of somebody working very agilely. Um, 
How about incapacity and reporting sickness? They're working from home. You know, what, what are the rules in terms of how they call in sick? Make sure that those are written down. I mentioned earlier on restrictive covenants. If uh, somebody's job location changes, and if there is a restrictive covenant that has a geographical basis, i.e. don't work in a competing industry within 10 miles, then if their place of work's changed, you might need to adapt those. I mentioned earlier the question of who pays for what. Make sure that that is uh, recorded clearly. So it could be the little things such as who's going to pay for ink cartridges, for the printer, who's going to pay for the, uh, the new workstation. Make sure that all of that is uh, recorded carefully. I think a big area with flexible working in this day and age is IT security. Um, obviously, the working from home brings additional risk in terms of security of IT and also security of data protection. And the obvious risks are that you have less control over the, um, how the employee is operating. You might ask yourself who else might have access to the employee's computer or their workstation. It might be a question of storing confidential information. If the employee is working at home, how do you make sure that any sensitive material is safely stored. You might review arrangements in terms of encryption and passwords that are used. You might ask the employee, well, what arrangements have they got to make sure that their home is secure? Um, transporting sensitive information, you know, clients' files, customers' files, customer data between the office and home. What are the rules about that? Making sure that the employee keeps those things safe, that they don't just leave them in the seat, uh, on the seat of their car as when they're driving home and they stop off at the supermarket. Destruction of um, sensitive information. Is the employee going to have a shredding machine to make sure that, you know, confidential waste doesn't just go in their um, domestic dustbin? So I think and you know, confidential information I, I've mentioned. So those areas, sensitive information, use of IT, data protection and confidential information, all very important. I think some other areas to, to just be thinking about, uh, making sure that they're ticked off. Insurance cover. Any employer must have employer's liability insurance. So liability for the actions of the employee will probably have its own insurance in relation to equipment at work. Make sure that that insurance cover extends to any expensive equipment that the employer places in the employee's home to enable them to, to work from home. Similarly, uh, if there's the risk that uh, what the employee does at home um, may affect other people, perhaps there's technical equipment, physical equipment that they use, um, make sure that uh, they've got insurance arrangements just to guard against the risk that uh, somebody else might get injured. It might be a member of their family, do something stupid. So make sure that all the insurance cover is in place. It's possible that the employee may need to check their mortgage, just uh, to check that the mortgage conditions don't prohibit working from home. There's an outside chance that business rates would apply if somebody used their, their office for a, their home as an office on a very regular basis, probably unlikely. Um, keep in mind um, some of the rules in relation to disability and reasonable adjustments. You know, the, the, the duty to make reasonable adjustments to help a disabled employee overcome any disadvantage that they suffer in the workplace applies just as much to home as it does to the workplace. So if you've got an employee who does come into the category of disabled, if they are saying, well, look, I need this uh, special adaptation if I'm going to be working from home, um, I need an additional piece of equipment, workstation, whatever it is, and if that would be regarded as a reasonable adjustment, then there's an obligation on the employer to, to make that adjustment. Okay, so I think that those are the, the most important areas in terms of 
the employment law issues that arise. What I'm going to do now is to move on to some of the health and safety issues that arise. Well, I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the uh, Health and Safety at Work Act. It imposes various obligations uh, on, employee, on employers. There's a basic obligation for all employers to take reasonable care of their employees' safety. Um, and uh, those rules apply in relation to people who work from home, just as they might apply in relation to those who work in the office uh, or in a factory. They include important obligations in terms of carrying out risk assessments. There are particular requirements in relation to those who use display screen equipment uh, regularly. So if you've got somebody working from home, they're going to be required to use uh, a computer, PC, laptop, etc., on a regular basis, continu continuous periods of more than an hour at a time then there's an obligation to uh, undertake a, a workstation assessment, make sure that you provide safe and suitable uh, equipment, and that you train employees in terms of the adequacy of uh, that equipment. Um, now, this, I think, is an important area when it comes to flexible working and agile working. It applies, as I say, to people who work from home. You, you know, there's obvious dangers that you allow somebody to work from home, and they're going to say, okay, well, uh, that's fine. I'll uh, work from my laptop at the kitchen table. Um, I'll use one of the kitchen chairs. Well, you've got to make an assessment of the risks involved in that in just the same way that you'd have to make that assessment if they were working in the office or in the factory. And it's very important that individuals are provided with the right equipment to enable them to work from home safely. And as I said at the outset, it's not just working from home. If, if there are other forms of agile working, shared working spaces, and shared work workstations, um, hot desking, you've got to make sure that you make, take adequate precautions to make sure that each of those working environments are safe for the employees that use them. Um, so that's one of the most important areas that you've got to keep in mind in terms of setting up somebody for agile working. Always worth reminding employees that they're under a uh, duty too. Um, they've got to take reasonable care of their own safety. And so I think it's worthwhile reminding employees of that. Obviously, if you do undertake the workstation assessment, if you visit the, work, uh, the worker's home, make sure that the setup is correct, then there's an obligation on the employee to maintain that setup no point doing the assessment then that you're allowing the employees to simply lapse into bad habits and remind employees of, of their duties in that uh, sense. Looking more closely at the uh, risk assessment, what might you uh, be looking at as you're undertaking that assessment? Well, I've mentioned the workstation is the obvious one. Make sure that all of the equipment is satisfactory. Lighting and noise is an important one. Make sure that uh, adequate arrangements of working from home. Consider loan working. Um, you know, particular issues arise when individuals work alone, you know, whether that's the question of falling, um, tripping, whatever. Make sure that there are arrangements to cover off any difficulties that might arise. Don't ignore them. Make the assessment of the level of risk. If there's no risk, well, that's fine. But make sure you've done that assessment and you have considered whatever possibilities do exist and make sure that um, they're adequately covered off. And then stress is another important area when you're undertaking the risk assessment. Um, working from home in particular brings with it particular issues in relation to isolation. Um, make sure employees have access to support. Make sure that any considerations that you offer towards your, your staff who work in the office about work-life balance are applied to, to somebody who is working from home. It's more complex in some senses because they have more control perhaps over the time periods that they're working. But make sure that you're looking at these issues when you're undertaking the assessment. 
And I think it's important that you make sure that there are proper arrangements for contact with the home worker, for the support to the home worker, and particularly inclusion within the rest of the workforce. Don't leave them feeling isolated. I think some of the control measures that you might be putting in place um, make sure that there are limits on the use of laptops. Make sure you're purchasing the correct equipment to enable somebody to, to work from home, work agilely. Make sure you give them, give them the training in terms of how to use that equipment in terms of setup and posture, etc. And as I said earlier on, make sure you don't ignore the important question of rest breaks. Make sure that the employees, given the encouragement to, to move around, so that you don't fall foul of some of those health and safety duties. So that's been a quick look at uh, some of the legal issues that arise from agile working, and a quick look also at some of the health and safety issues. Um, I think that we do have time for some questions, if um, Scott can uh, organise those. So I'm handing back to you, Scott. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Simon. That was great. Um, yeah, so a couple of the questions are centering around, sorry if you'd bear with me, having some uh, IT glitches here as to opening this up. A couple relating to copies of the reports, or sorry, a copy of these the slides. Uh, we do have the webinars that are uploaded to our website um, after the presentation, so you guys should see those on Monday. Um, question here about um, if the home worker uses company supplied equipment, example laptop or phone, who would be expected to insure this for loss of damage? Would it be the employer or em employees um, on their, their home insurance? Well, generally speaking, I would say that the employer should be uh, insuring it because at the end of the day, it's, the, uh, it's going to be the employer's loss if the employer has paid for it. It's always going to be slightly too tricky to make sure that the employee has covered it under their own insurance. So I would say uh, 90 time, 99 times out of 100, the employer should make sure that uh, their equipment is properly insured. Great. If someone requests home working or chooses to work from home, they have a base and a workstation in the office. Um, does the organization need to provide the desk, the chair, the equipment, et cetera? No, there's no obligation to allow somebody to work from home. So if, uh, if an employee is based in the office and they ask whether they can work from home, which is obviously quite a common scenario, there's no obligation to agree to it. Um, if one of the questions that you'll be asking, uh, if somebody does uh, make a request to work from home is, Okay, well, what's your setup at home? And that is a very important question to ask because you need to be satisfied that the setup at home is safe. So ask the employee, well, what are, what are your arrangements? Have you got a separate study? Is it properly uh, secure? Is it, uh, have you got your own um, PC? Are you able to work from a desk? Um, all those questions that you relate to a safe working environment. If the employee says, no, I haven't, uh, what I'm planning on doing is using my laptop and uh, don't worry, I'll, I can do it in the living room, and then there's a clear risk there that uh, you know, the, the work area is not going to be suitable for home working, that it's not safe. You know, somebody craning over a laptop for extended periods is likely to do themselves any harm. And at that point, I would be saying, well, we can't allow you to do that. And it then becomes a choice for the employer. Do we then say, all right, well, if we're going to agree to this request from home and we need to make sure that the workplace is safe, um, who's going to uh, pay for the, um, for the proper equipment? There's no obligation on the employer to pay for it. But the if the employee says, I'm, I, I can't pay for, for that sort of equipment, then don't allow the home working because the last thing you want to do is to allow somebody to uh, to work at home in an unsafe environment. So I, I hope that answers the question. To be fair, there's a couple like that. I've got I've got a different one here with with agile working, or I think hot desking is the main 
thing in question here within an office environment does uh, an assessment need to be completed at all of the workstations that, that that individual works at or can a blanket DSE assessment be done for general awareness well the the obligation is to uh, to undertake the assessment and, and then to take reasonable care of the uh, individual's safety so if you do have a situation where an employee is, is regularly working, say, in a hot desking environment, then you do need to make sure that that hot desking environment, which may involve several different workstations, is uh, suitable, that, that all of the, the workstations are suitable. Now, obviously, there's, you know, there's quite a significant uh, burden if, for every employee in an organization, every conceivable permutation, every conceivable workstation has to be assessed. So you're going to need to be thinking about, okay, well, where does the employee work most regularly? If, for example, hot desking is just an occasional thing, then I think it would be sensible to make sure that there is some assessment of that hot desk to make sure that it is suitably equipped uh, as far as is reasonable for all the employees that will work there. If, uh, if the individual is going to be working at that particular uh, workstation on a regular basis, um, perhaps a couple of days a week, then I think uh, reasonableness requires that uh, assessment is made for that particular station, for that particular individual to make sure that it's suitable. Okay. Um, ready for a couple more questions? Should we keep rolling with this? Yeah, by all means. Yep. <laughs> um, if someone falls down the stairs or has an accident at home, does an accident form need to be completed by the employer? Um, I, if I'm honest, I don't know off the top of my head, but my gut feel is yes, um, because the individual, let, let, you know, basic principles are that the uh, the duties that the employer owes to employees working at home in terms of health and safety are just the same as the uh, duties that they owe to people working in the work in inside the workplace. So, if the purpose of reporting is to make sure that injuries are recorded and that steps are taken to prevent it happening from happening again, then logic suggests strongly that uh, an incident form should be completed. Okay. You mentioned uh, including a statement into any letter confirming a home working arrangement that we reserve the right to revert back to the former arrangement. Should a time frame be applied to this, or would it be acceptable to say within a reasonable time frame, or should it be kept? No, I would. I would keep it open ended because there's two possibilities. One is that the particular arrangement doesn't work out very well. Um, because it was just, uh, it, it, there might be some barrier to it working well. The other thing, of course, is that the employer's requirements might change. You know, we, we, everything changes in life uh, in the workplace. So there might come a time when it just doesn't suit the employer any longer to allow the individual to work from home, um, at which point it would be good if the employer can say, well, look, we're going to need to change back. So I would keep it open-ended. Okay, great. We've got a pack, a pack testing question here. If work equipment is supplied for a home worker, like the computer, printer, copier, etc., does the employer have an obligation to ensure pad testing is carried out on that in that site? Again, I'm not certain, but my strong suspicion is yes. If okay, the equipment is, few... is sorry, Anigo. Yeah, I was just going to say if the if the equipment is supplied by the employer, then. Um, you know, I, th I think effectively the employer is vouching that well that that, that equipment is safe, and it, so it, it, I'm I would be pretty sure that that needs to be tested in the same way that workplace equipment needs to be tested. There's quite a few relating to regular DSE assessments here, so I'll cover those just at the end, um, if that's okay. Um, yeah. The um, if the employment contract states that the employee must work from home, surely this ne uh, ne necessitates the employer purchasing suitable furniture and kit. Yeah, I think that if if you, as an employer, say to an employee who currently works in the office, you must work from home, then it's a significant change to the contractual relationship. And 
An employer isn't entitled to impose uh, changes in the contractual relationship on the employee. Um, so if an employer wants to insist that an employee works from home, then it's going to need to get the employer's agreement to it. And if it's going to be uh, equipment that will need to be purchased, then it's highly likely that in order to get that agreement, the employer is going to need to, um, to pay for the equipment. So I think, broadly speaking, if the employer is insisting that the employee work from home, then the, the employer should be paying for it. But it's a big change in somebody's working arrangements. There might be many reasons why somebody doesn't want to work from home. Um, and uh, if an employer insists on it, which is quite a rare scenario, but if an employer insists on it, then it's, uh, it needs to, do, to, to tread carefully. It's on quite thin ice. Okay, great. On the similar lines then, if an employer insists that the employee works from home, who pays for the heating, lighting, etc.? Well, I think the same logic applies, that um, if the employer is insisting on a change in the contractual arrangement, then the employer has got to get the employee's agreement, and probably the employer has got to move some way towards making sure that the employee doesn't lose out as a result of the change. So if the employee is saying, well, hang on, I'm going to be uh, needing to heat my home um, for more extended periods, I, I, I don't want to lose out there, then the employer probably, to get the employee's agreement, is going to have to, uh, to agree to, to fund that. Okay, great. A um, couple of DSE-relating questions here, just in terms of employment law. If you have sent a DSE link to an employee, and they don't respond, how often do you need to keep asking them to complete that link? Again, I don't know the technical answer, but I think that common sense says that you need to, to be able to show that you have uh, made reasonable efforts to make sure that it's completed. I think that, uh, you know, make sure that you follow up perhaps by way of an email, follow up by way of a phone call in case the emails aren't getting through. But then I think the really important thing is that if it's just not getting done for whatever reason, you've got to work through the implications of that. If, if it's not being done and so that you're not therefore able to say, well, the work environment is safe, then if the employee suffers an injury as a result of that, then you'll be liable for it. So I think that my reaction would be, if you're not going to do the, um, if you're not going to cooperate in terms of some of the health and safety and DSE requirements, and you don't complete the bits that you need to complete, then we're not going to let you work from home. But you know, obviously, whether or not you're in a position to, 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 to say that probably depends upon who, who's asking for the homeworking. If it's the employee, then they'll probably quickly comply. If in the unusual situation that you've got an employer insisting on homeworking, well, we're, we're back to the previous discussion. It, 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 it might be tougher. Okay, finish this up with two more questions. These might be kind of uh, directed more towards the kind of the work rate side of things that Posturite do. Um, but do you have a useful DSE risk assessment that can be used for mobile working? Um, I don't personally. Um, I don't, it may be that the Posturite team uh, have, have those. Otherwise, I would encourage anybody to have a good look at the HSC website. And the second one is, can individuals self-assess their home workstations or the, uh, must the company go do them? The, um, I mean, the important thing is that the assessment gets done and uh, the reasonable care is, is, is taken in making sure that the working environment is safe. Obviously, uh, where the assessment is done by the individual you've got to be confident that your processes in terms of the assessment are comprehensive so that you're confident you'll be able to confidently say at the end of that well we know that the workstation has been assessed properly um we've used an online tool or whatever and we're confident that uh, it's a, a safe environment if you've got any doubts as to whether or not um, that's been done competently, sensibly, or honestly, then I think it would be sensible 
to arrange for a company representative to, to do the assessment. But obviously, you know, it's, it can be difficult and can be expensive if somebody is working from home on just say, a very occasional basis. So I think there's a question of balance there. But you know, I, the, the primary obligation is to make sure that reasonable care is taken of the health and safety of the individual. So if there's any doubt about whether or not the assessment has been done competently, then it ought to be done by the company. I've just seen one final one come in here, and is there a minimum size desk um, to be utilized for DSE work? Is there, is there a desk that's too small? Um, again, I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, and it may well be that the uh, HSE website will contain more guidance as to the, um, to the, to the specific size, etc. My strong inclination is that there won't be a specific size that is a requirement. I think that it's highly likely that the arrangements will be sort of um, set out in more general terms, talking about you know, making sure that the desk space is, is reasonably adequate, um, because not everything can easily be measured, whether you're talking about lighting, ventilation, etc. Most of the terminology, terminology is in terms of ad adequate lighting, adequate uh, ventilation, etc. Okay, fantastic. I think that's all the questions. Okay. Right, well, it's, there, uh, uh, it's been a... Sorry, Simon. Sorry, you... Scott. I was just no, going to you... say it's been a pleasure uh, to, to try and uh, offer some assistance. And uh, if anybody's got any questions, then my contact details are hopefully still up on the screen. Don't hesitate to let me know. And to follow on from that, I've seen a couple of questions here um, relating to uh, products, um, training, um, all things that Posturite can help assist. This probably isn't the right forum to kind of promote those, um, but if there are any questions about any of those things, feel free to, to pop through to the uh, customer support line on the website that, that Posturite have in the bottom right-hand corner, and we'll help facilitate it moving forward. Fantastic, thanks very much, Simon. That was really, really great. Um, as uh, mentioned before, this will be uploaded to the Posturite website under the webinar section um, on Monday. Um, and if anyone needs any certification or anything like that following this, please let us know. And uh, yeah, thanks everyone for your help. And we will speak to everyone soon. Thank you very much.